Well, hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. I uh, don't usually think you guys care much about hearing my own stories as to where I am and why I'm there and what's going on. But this particular uh, week has been a real labor of love to get this thing recorded because I am actually out of my desert house in Rancho Mirage, California, and the uh, Wi-Fi went down. So I am recording across the street from my own house at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, just so I can give you this week's Dividend Cafe. It uh, is absolutely uh, amazing how dependent our lives become on Wi-Fi and the interconnection of home appliances and systems and basic living with, with such things in addition to you know the work functions like recording Dividend Cafe. So I'm glad it was all uh, able to work out here, and hopefully you'll get some information out of this week's Divin Cafe. that will be interesting to you, but thought I'd explain why I'm in a different destination than intended. Let's talk about this week. As I'm sitting here recording, we're literally at 38,000 on the Dow, and last Friday afternoon when the market closed, we were at 38,000 on the Dow. So this could seem like an uneventful week, except for there were 330 missiles fired at Israel by Iran last Saturday, and Israel did some form of a quasi-retaliation against Iran last night, and in between there were interest rates moving and oil prices moving and earnings season beginning, so you would think this would have been a week of some substantial market volatility, especially coming off the last two weeks uh, where markets had dropped with, uh, roughly 1,500 points on the Dow, um, 3 to 4% in the S&P and the Dow. And yet it appears that we're going to end up somewhere right where we started. So I just thought I'd reiterate something I'd said a couple weeks ago. In any short-term per- period, a week, two weeks, a month, two, whatever it is, um, the answer as to what could happen is that markets can go up a lot, markets can go up a little, markets can go down a lot, markets can go down a little, or markets can stay flat. And I think you will find that those five options cover most ground. And here we are. Um, An interesting question has come up, as I have been making the case lately, that ironically, the biggest risk to upside inflation at this point is oil prices. Uh, that if you were to see these oil prices that are, are right now hanging in there through a lot of Middle East geopolitical turmoil in the mid 80s. But if you were to see things break up into the 90s, let alone 100, that becomes the issue that really changes um, the picture with headline inflation that is obviously completely out of the control of the Federal Reserve, all in a period of time where most other components have been conveniently disinflating, even if not at the rapid pace that they wanted to be able to have optical cover to begin cutting rates. And a few people, uh, because I've written so much about um, where I think the Biden administration has has struggled to fill back some of the strategic petroleum reserves that they, in 2022, depleted a just massive amount of the oil, bringing our levels of emergency reserves down to where they were in the early 80s. And for a number of factors, some that you could argue were their own mismanagement and others that were out of their control, they have not filled back the SPR. And some have asked, you know, do you think in election year, they're going to have incentive if oil prices do get back up to around 90 going in the summer to not only not fill back SBR, but to pull it down further, to deplete more from the strategic reserves. And, and I wanted to address that because obviously I don't know and I, and I don't want to be so cynical, but I certainly do not want to participate in giving politicians the benefit of the doubt any more than I want to go around always assuming the worst. So I think it's it's certainly fair to say that that type of thing could be possible. But the only caveat I'd give is I don't really know that it'd be that politically beneficial. I think it would be perceived as so, um, uh, shall we say, cynical um, and opportunistic that it may very well backfire if they were to do something like that. Um, The dollar is 
a subject that comes up quite a bit for more permanently bearish people. It's an easy way to look at some of the um, rightfully criticized elements of fiscal and monetary policy in our country and then go to a conclusion that has a way of sounding kind of smart and sounding kind of dramatic without people necessarily really understanding what they're saying. And that is to predict that the dollar is going to disintegrate, evaporate, lose status, fall apart, et cetera, et cetera. And I've always made the case that we can criticize policy where we want, but to make the argument that the dollar is going to fall apart has to involve some substitute replacement that has always been lacking in that conversation. But I just and and then the fact that the people have been usually the people saying it have been saying it for so long it, it it's not been a great track record of prediction. I, I feel like I'm being very nice right now. The um, Treasury Secretary of the United States of America, Chair uh, Janet Yellen, former Chairwoman of the Federal Reserve, issued a joint release with the head of the Bank of Japan and head of uh, uh, Treasury at South Korea this week, um, acknowledging the sharp depreciation of the Japanese yen and the Korean won in recent um, weeks and effectively committing to some sort of coordinated response or whatnot. This is all code. It's all veiled language for essentially them all coordinating and working together for them to sell dollars if need be. And again, the fair caveat to offer is they may not have to actually do it because by threatening to do it, it could have a market impact. The dollar did come down a little when they did so. But this is what we're talking about. A day and age where people are just saying, oh, the dollar is going to get hammered. They're actually having to take emergency, almost unprecedented efforts to stop the dollar from rallying so much. That's what we're dealing with. And yet most of the conversation is, don't you think the dollar is going to collapse? Interpret that for what you will. Maybe it's just simply because the dollar is in a moment of rally and yet really just around the corner, it's all going to collapse. But this is what we're talking about is not unprecedented dollar collapse, but the rally and other currency struggles forcing integrated response amongst some of the different um, financial heads of developed economies around the world. The S&P 500 right now, speaking of economies around the world, is in the 90th percentile and then some. I think it's like the 94th percentile in terms of its historical valuation. The Hang Seng, which is the uh, Hong Kong stock market index, is in the fourth percentile. The fourth percentile. 96% of the time, the market's been more expensive than it is now. It's trading about eight times earnings. Now, there's usually reasons for things like this. Do I have the guts to enter the Hong Kong stock market on a valuation call right now? I do not. Um, but it's worth pointing out. Now, I wanted to also say the UK, uh, which does not have the imposition of CCP hanging over it the way Hong Kong does, which is really what is the, the basis of that downward pressure in Hong Kong. Um, the UK is on average for about 15 years traded at a 20% discount in valuation to the United States stock market. And it's currently trading at a 47% discount in valuation to the U.S. stock market. So you could look at the valuation difference and say, oh, wow, that's something. But you could also look at the valuation difference now compared to what the valuation difference has historically been. And that is a perhaps even more accurate story um, pertaining to either excessive valuation in the United States or a value uh, opportunity in the UK or perhaps both. Contrarianism, I talk about a lot as an investment philosophy, as a mentality, and I largely favor it around the idea of not playing into crowds, not just understanding that when there's a consensus view, everyone thinks X, that is not ever, 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 ever true that everyone thinks X, but no one has yet priced that into X. Uh, if everyone thinks that it, it's already in the price and now it could be even bigger than people think and people could think it and invite more people to think it. And there's a, a momentum story and a greater fool theory uh, that could all push prices higher. But the problem with something in the consensus view is that it's in the price. The problem on the other side, when something is underappreciated, is that you could be wrong and you most certainly are going to have to be patient. 
And I think that um, that requires a lot of humility. And yet the, the better way to put, uh, to summarize how we view contrarian investing is always avoiding the madness of the crowds, but never um, just simply saying we want to go do the opposite. You know, everybody out there thinks that mud mixed up with lima beans is a bad meal. So because they all think it, I'm going to, I'm going to eat it instead. I mean, there are certain things obviously where betting against the crowd for the sake of betting against the crowd is as dumb as betting with the crowd. The, the fundamental tenet of contrarian investing has got to be independent thought. It has to be conviction that avoids doing things just because others aren't just as much as it avoids doing things just because others are. Um, and, and that's where I advocate so much for investing out of one's own beliefs and philosophy and process. And I think that that tends to be a truly countercultural thing. For those paying attention to Bitcoin, it is down about $8,000 in the last few days, roughly 11%. It dropped 9% in a minute after um, the uh, issues with Israel and Iran. I don't care if someone thinks it's going to zero. I don't care if someone thinks it's going to 500,000. Um, I am totally, completely agnostic about anything speculative and lacking an in internal rate of return. But I just want to push back on one thing, uh, which is so easy to push back on because I'm so empirically correct. When people like it or don't like it, and yet refer to it as a flight to safety, a safe haven, like, okay, well, you know, maybe we should have Bitcoin, maybe we shouldn't, but it's one of those things that if, they, if everyone rejects the dollar, there's a lot of uh, risk here, at least, you know, Bitcoin can be this uh, uh, anti-fragile asset we call it, like a treasury bill. It's pretty much the most untrue thing I think I've ever heard. Uh, Bitcoin's volatility makes the volatility of most risk assets look like child's play. Uh, this is not to say it can't go higher. It's not to say it can't go lower. It is to simply say that it does not and never has behaved anything like a safe haven. It's not an anti-fragile asset. It's got a very, very high correlation with micro cap NASDAQ stocks. It has a very low correlation with treasury bills. That's all I have to say. Uh, auto insurance up 22% year over year. And why might that be uh, a relevant piece from Ben Carlson this week, who I thought had some thoughtful observations. He, he talked about the possibility that people are just worse drivers now. And I, I, you know, I think that there may be something to that. I don't really know. I do know that with uh, smartphone use in a car, that the total number of car accidents is, is higher. But what we also know is that uh, the price of used cars and the price of new cars went up a lot in 2022, and then they've sort of disinflated since then. And I suspect that auto insurance having 22% inflation in 2023 was a lag effect to the high increase in, in cars in 2022. So um, that seems to me to be Occam's razor here in understanding inflation. Finally, I want to leave you with a comment on cronyism. I hate cronyism. I hate crony capitalism. I am a free marketeer. And I believe that there needs to be, and I try my very best in, in my platform and, and work to do this, to make a moral case against cronyism as being discriminatory, unfair, uh, uh, partial, and allowing big and powerful and resources to to uh, gain an advantage not available to less big and less powerful, and that it is not um, a byproduct of a market economy. It's an anti-market economy. It is the marriage of business with government to, for the means of picking winners and losers. And yet I also think that we fail sometimes to only make the moral argument, which is primary for me, when we don't make the productivity argument that cronyism is highly unproductive, it disincentivizes very non-productive activity and behavior. It essentially allocates resources wrongly. It, it provides subsidies to things that otherwise would not get it. It moves capital around. It distorts price discovery. It creates other costs borne by taxpayers cost of regulation, cost of, of, of legal lobbying. There's a regulatory burden it puts in the private sector. 
these, all of these attentions and all of these efforts are describing essentially non-productive activity instead of competitive and productive activity. Cronyism is a problem not only for its ethical connotations, but for what it does to the productivity of the economy. And the last thing this economy needs is anything else putting downward pressure on productivity. So I will leave it there for the week. Check out the chart of the week and quote of the week at DividendCafe.com. And I look forward to bringing you another Dividend Cafe on Monday, our weekly uh, trip around the horn of all current events. I will see you on Monday and have a wonderful weekend. Mm -hmm.